In the previous lesson, we have introduced the subject of sexual offences and the first of the major sexual offences, this being the Section 1 crime of rape. In this lesson, what we're going to do is talk about one of the major issues in not just the crime of rape, but also any of the sexual offences that you wish to think about. This is the idea of consent. And consent is something that is very, very difficult to reconcile with the ordinary uh, ongoings of the law. Uh, and there are a number of very complicated circumstances in which consent is very, very difficult to both ascertain and both to um, prove a lack of consent in certain circumstances. One of the reasons why sexual offences, at least in my opinion, is quite un are quite unique in terms of how they are positioned in the broader context of the criminal law. And so we're going to talk about uh, consent, we'll talk about what the law says about consent, we'll talk about what the Sexual Offences Act says about consent, and maybe talk about some of the considerations that we can think about in this, um, in this lesson. So we know already from the last lesson that uh, at least when we talk about the crime of rape, and in, in, in this case uh, most of the other sexual offences, um, one of the things that needs to be shown in these cases of sexual offences is whether or not the victim had given consent, whether or not the victim had consented to the sexual activity that they were involved in. That's the first point. And then the second point, because this is not just a strict liability offence, some of the sexual offences are strict liability, which we'll get to when we look at offences against children, but at least the general sexual offences are not strict liability. So there not only has to be a uh, consent on the part of the victim, but the intentional penetration on the part of the defendant must also be done with a lack of consent, no, a lack of knowledge of consent. OK, the defendant must not have reasonable knowledge of the consent um, that 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 doesn't exist. OK, this concept of consent applies to all of the offences which are cited in sections one to four. So this is rape. This is assault by penetration. This is sexual assault. And this is also um, causing another individual to engage in sexual activity. If we then jump from section one to four to looking at section 74, we can see that for the purposes of this part, a person consent if he agrees by choice and has the freedom and capacity to make that choice. That's how the legislation defines what consent is. It is an agreement by choice, but also not only an agreement by choice, but also a choice that is devoid of and lacks any kind of coercive capability. OK, so not only do you have to agree by choice, but you can't be coerced into doing so such that you have no free will. You must also have the freedom and capacity to make said choice. Section 75 brings us some more relations to, um, brings us a relation to the idea of an evidential presumption about consent. And we're going to read out section 75 in almost its entirety because it's very, very interesting. So essentially, if in the proceedings for an offence to which this section applies, it is proved that the defendant did the relevant act, that any of the circumstances specified in subsection 2 existed, we'll get to subsection 2 in a second, and that the defendant knew that the choice of those circumstances existed, the complaint is to be taken to uh, not to have consented to the relevant act unless sufficient evidence is adduced to raise an issue as to whether he consented. And the defendant is to be taken not to have reasonably believed that the complainant consented unless sufficient evidence is adduced to raise an issue as to whether he reasonably believed it. OK, so. When we think about consent and when we think about how we apply the law to procedure and we actually apply the law to a trial and, and present this evidence to, to a jury, there is an evidential presumption on consent. OK. If the things that we can see in subsection 2, which we'll get to in a second, can be shown, then there is a presumption of a lack of consent and a presumption of a lack of reasonable belief in consent, which is then to be rebutted by the other party. The circumstances that we're talking about is section 75 part 2, which says that the circumstances are that any person was at the time of the relevant act or immediately before it began using violence against the complainant or causing the complainant to fear the immediate violence would be used against him. If this can be shown, if you can show that there is either violence against the complainant or there is a reasonable um, or, or, or at least the complainant is um, has fear of an immediate violent act uh, against them, 
then you presume a lack of consent and it is only then for uh, the 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 defense to try and rebut that presumption similarly you pr you presume a lack of consent if any person was at the time of the relevant act or immediately before it began causing the complainant to fear that violence was being used or that immediate would uh, immediately would be used against another person so this is less uh, violence to yourself, but if the defendant says something like, for example, if uh, if you don't have sex with me, uh, I will kill your child or I will kill somebody you um, you, you you know and love, um, this would also constitute um, uh, basically making the presumption that there was not consent in the act itself. Part C says that the complainant was and the defendant was not lawfully detained at the time of the relevant act. Sub, uh, part D says the complainant was asleep or otherwise unconscious at the time of the relevant act. Very, very easy to understand here. If an individual, the victim here, was asleep or unconscious at the time at which the sexual activity began, then the presumption is that they did not consent. And the presumption is also that the defendant did not reasonably believe in consent. How can an individual consent when they're asleep? And how can the defendant reasonably believe that the individual is consenting when they're asleep? Both things are, um, uh, the presumption is the other way around. Because of the complainant's physical disability, the complainant would not have been able at the time of the relevant act to communicate to the defendant whether or not the complainant consented. Again, owing to some kind of physical disability, if they are unable to communicate to the defendant a lack of consent, then when the complaint, uh, when the defendant, sorry, um, uh, performs sexual activity against the complainant, then there is a presumption that there was no consent in the in the act itself. Part F says that any person had administered to or caused to be taken by the complainant without the complainant's consent, a substance which, having regard to when it was administered or taken, was capable of causing or enabling the complainant to be um, stupefied or overpowered at the time of the relevant act. Um, a number of things can be done in this regard. So, for example, uh, simply spiking someone's drink or uh, maybe um, getting them too drunk to be able to consent. OK, but in, in doing so, you can also have a situation where you spike someone's drink to make them unconscious. And at which point um, you have um, both part D and part F um, applying to the to the provision. So the third uh, of the methods for showing lack of consent is actually found in section 76. So this is the presumption uh, element. So section 74 defines what consent is in the positive. Section 75 defines the circumstances in which consent is um, going to be presumed to not exist in the circumstance. So if any of these circumstances exist, then there is a presumption that there was no consent and there was a presumption that there is no reasonable belief in consent. And it is therefore defined in the negative, if you will. And it is up to the defense to rebut this particular presumption. And then section 76 has the final concept of consent um, or lack thereof. And this is for cases of deception and this is for cases of deception as to the nature or purpose of the act which could form uh, and establish the lack of consent a, a non-consent okay now you'll notice that section 75 and section 76 will have an, an impact on the actus reus element of the uh, offense but it would also have a, an impact on the mens rea element because of the lack of reasonable belief in consent so section 75 does not just presume there is a lack of consent but section 75 also presumes that there is a lack of reasonable belief in consent in addition to a lack of consent Finally, then, what about section 76? These are conclusive presumptions about consent. If in the proceedings of an offence to which this section applies, it is proved that the defendant did the relevant act and that any of the circumstances specified in subsection 2 existed, then it can be conclusively presumed that the complainant did not consent to the relevant act and that the defendant did not believe that the complainant consented to the relevant act. These circumstances in section 76 subsection 2 are as follows. They say that the defendant intentionally deceives the complainant as to the nature or purpose of the relevant act. 
Um, we will get to some examples of this in the case law, but there, there are examples where um, the defendant essentially deceives the victim into believing that um, having sex with them would help with um, various different things. So one of them, I believe, was a music teacher who, who deceived a student into believing that having sex would cause them to, uh, I believe, uh, be able to... Um, uh, be, be, essentially be able to 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 improve their ability to sing or something or or maybe um their ability to uh, play a, 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 a musical instrument again these are the kinds of things that we're talking about so uh, the nature or purpose of the relevant act is deceived into believing they're deceived into believing that it is for a different reason other than just sexual gratification Part B says that the defendants intentionally induced the complainant to consent to the relevant act by impersonating a person known personally to the complainant. So if you pretend to be somebody else and the victim then believes that they are having sex with somebody else and then they find that they are having sex with you, then you have intentionally deceived them and therefore a rebutting um, will be in terms of a conclusive presumption about consent will be made in relation to section 76.